Okay, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we have set up, uh, many of you have joined these plant records webinars in the past. Uh, and today we have a topic we've titled with a question mark, ain't got time for plant records. Uh, so this was inspired by um, many of these polls we've done in the past. And we've found that time is basically one of the critical factors for many. Uh, so that's what we're going to explore today. Together with me today, uh, we have uh, Wahid, Dr. Wahid Arsad, our botanical scientist. Hello, everyone. Yeah, nice to see you all again for our final webinar of the year. And I've even taken the trouble to wear a Christmas jumper. So, oh, yeah. well done. <laughs> Great. Oh, and I don't know if Greg is with us. So, Greg has been uh, like a co pilot uh, coming uh, with uh, his uh, sort of excellent input during these sessions. If he's not here today, he's here in spirit, I'm sure. Uh, so uh, without any further ado, we'll go to the slides here. So um, the slides, uh, we use, uh, we're gonna do a few polls during the session. So if you wouldn't mind uh, taking up your smartphone or opening a browser and visit this particular link. The nice thing here is then you could also basically get a permanent link to the whole slide deck. But uh, that will uh, also allow you to um, basically uh, participate in the polls. So we're going to have a few. So part of this session is not only for us to share our thoughts about this particular topic, about time and, and timekeeping and record keeping flows, but also learn a bit more about what you struggle with and also learn about the great experience that many of you have. So, so uh, I assume most people have managed to scan this barcode now, either with your phone or opened your browser on your desktop. And uh, if you have problems, uh, we can also send the link on the chat, Wahid. Maybe that's... Uh, yeah, uh, the chat, the link is there for people who want to follow with, uh, with their desktop, but uh, you can also scan that with your mobile phone. Yeah, great. So today we're gonna focus on record keeping workflows, discuss different aspects around that and the challenges around that. We're also going to give you at the end a bit of an update from our team on Hortis. And then we're going to have a little uh, kind of a wish list question at the end. OK, so uh, so one thing we just respect, re reflected on here is, is whether record keeping is a chore. And, and uh, you know, what is a chore? What's the definition of a chore? Uh, we had a discussion here about analog analogous to washing dishes. You know, uh, as a as a chore that you really may be not enjoying, and then, hey, you get a dishwasher. Suddenly, things life improves, and the, it becomes less of a chore. I'm not saying the analogy of a record keeping system is the dishwasher in that context, but there is something to that. In that, certain things can actually be eliminated and become more part of a daily life that you really don't think about too much, but it, it, it the work gets done. And, and maybe that's where we are heading and that's where we want to head. So it becomes more of an integral part of how you work. And, and these kind of sessions, it's very helpful to inform us as well on how we evolve the product. Uh, so, so it's really great uh, that you are all here to share your thoughts and ideas. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, for, this is a, a poll we did a while back where we uh, asked about the things that people struggled with the most. Uh, what, what, and, and time, is, you see, is one of the big, big ones. Uh, and, and a lot of other things, of course, but that's why we, we feel that um, this is uh, worth digging into a bit deeper. Um, so uh, we are then going to start our first poll today, which is, what is your top tip for improving the efficiency of your record keeping? So uh, use the app uh, on your smartphone or, or and then you could just um, put in your response uh, and then we should see a word cloud popping as we type. And you get three options, I think, right? Isn't that the case? Yeah. Yeah, you should have three options um, and you can input words or phrases or sentences if you like, um, and they should start appearing. If anyone's having issues, give a shout. Yeah. Here we go. We might 
be tempted to ask some of you to, to elaborate a bit. Uh, I love the avoid procrastination. That's a good one. Yeah, integrate record keeping in your day. That's uh, that aligns very well with what we talked about earlier here. Little and often is a good one. We might come back uh, a bit later on in our talk about that particular topic. We might, uh, as we've done in the past, write a sort of um, uh, a blog article about, about this, this session as well, because we're going to have an, another session this evening for anybody on the uh, sort of Pacific side of the America and Australia. So we get another poll from them as well, and we we'll see if we can streamline them together. We'll let this roll for another minute, I think, and then we'll move. Publish and be damned. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Who is uh... just for those who I know that there's a few people who've entered, joined us a bit late. Uh, maybe we should share the the Menti link again in chat because I don't think they see the the link um, when they join after the start of the session. Okay, I think we'll, here we go. Yeah, here's a few more. Um, retention of staff is a good one, yeah. Improved technology, workflow. Uh, consistency, patience, streamlining. Those are the top, top ones here we can see. Okay, this is very helpful. Thank you so much. Um, as I say, we'll share this uh, on our blog, uh, and then add an article so you can uh, elaborate more, and then we'll combine, uh, you know, what uh, people are saying in the southern uh, southern hemisphere as, as well. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, was there another one here? Yeah, that's this answer. Yeah, great. Sorry. Um, so, the key one key question that we have discussed uh, many times before as well is is is, and I think. This might be, uh, you know, automatic for many, but it's worth repeating. And that is, why do you keep records in the first place? And and the 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 driver for that is should be, I we think, the mission of your institution. You 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 grow plants for a reason. Uh, it might be research, conservation, or it could be education, or a combination of everything. And there's a reason why the different plants are where they are in the garden. So that uh, should then uh, drive your collection policy. Why do you acquire certain plants and why do you ignore others? Maybe you have the national collection of magnolias or whatever. Uh, and then from that, we should then have a bit of an understanding why we record data in the first place. What information is important, what is not? And that helps you uh, to, um, to sort of um, guide your, your work in a, in a structured manner. And, and uh, we, I think we're going to have a quick poll on this as well. I know this might be a bit excessive, but we really want to know how people feel about this in their life, in that, uh, do you feel like you record enough or you record too much or too little, etc. So, so, but this, I think, is a key to help you as an institution. I don't know if you want to add anything, Wayne, before we do the poll. Yeah, no, I was thinking, I'm speaking with a lot of gardens, it's good to think about, you know, why are you collecting the data in the first place? You know, are you aware of how it links to your mission? And if not, you know, there should be steps taken to try and better understand the the, the whys behind why you're collecting the data. And I think once once you as a record keeper have a better understanding of that, it can give you a sense of how your work fits into the big picture. And I think without having that knowledge to hand can you know be a, a lot more insightful when when you're doing your day-to-day -day record keeping yeah certainly so let's 
uh, take another poll. Oops, uh, I think, no, that was not the poll here. Yeah, this, this uh, maybe you could uh, walk through this slide, Wahid. Um, yeah, so going, we had a, Havard and I had a bit of a brainstorm before the webinar started, and we were thinking of what are the three main parts of good record keeping. And the, the first one we feel is capturing the right data. So as I say, you know, making sure it links to your mission uh, and, and why you exist as a botanic garden. But also the, the second part of that is capturing it when and where it happens. So uh, in, instead of uh, allowing records or information to sit in one place before it gets uploaded, you know, there's a, a lot of um, benefit to keeping on top of the changes. And we saw that earlier on, regular and timely updates to your to your inventory, for example. And, and those are two huge factors that um, kind of contribute to, to a good record keeping practice. And the third thing that we're going to elaborate a bit more on is the ability to evolve and innovate, uh, and not only as an individual, uh, but also as an institution, you know, what, what are the tools that you're using? You know, are you aware of some of the technologies that are in place? You know, are your workflows the, the, the most efficient they can be? Are you aware of what other gardens are doing? Um, and that concept of how technology can play a part in, in good record keeping. Yeah, great. Um, so one, uh, question we have for you then is, do you feel you capture the right amount of data? So do you collect too much? Do you collect not enough? Or are you not sure? I suppose that I'm not sure is when you are really very uncertain about the mission uh, and how your records should be used or could be used. It would also be interesting to hear from those of you who feel you don't collect enough information. What what is it that you're lacking, and perhaps why you might be lacking that? Be interesting to hear if anybody wants to give us more of an insight. Yeah, maybe we should ask for one one volunteer who is uh, part of the 57% group. Should I say something? <laughs> yes, Martin, thank you. <laughs> well, I can only speak for ourselves, but at the moment we don't um, uh, collect, uh, collect uh, enough because we don't have the tools and the systems in place to collect that data. So uh, things like images and other things that would enrich uh, uh, the data set. So, uh, so just simply because the tools aren't there or the time isn't there to do it, but we would love to have the data, uh, things like phonology, whatever. Um, there's a lot of things that would be ideal to even capture that, but the, the tools and the time are not available at the moment to us. And I think that's the, 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 the two together, tools and time. Uh, we might not ever get more time. I think we're stuck with 24 hours a day, more or less. And uh, <laughs> so it's more about how, how, how efficient you could be with the time you have. And, and certain things can be got done quicker so you have more time to do other things, et cetera. So yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. I think we'll, uh, we see here that a few people are not sure. And there's not a single person on this uh, wonderful panel of ours who feel they collect too much. So that's uh, probably good, I think. Uh, I suppose you, you might not know that you collect too much. Maybe that's the scenario, I don't know. Okay, here we got one more, but now I think we'll move over to um, the rest of the session. Thank you again for taking part here. It's really helpful. Um, so we're gonna have the last uh, poll for now, and that is, uh, because we know that a lot of people find things time consuming and uh, we are not sure about what, uh, what are the things in your garden, since you don't have enough time, it might be either because you've spent too much time on things you find 
that should take a shorter time. So if you could share your thoughts there, that would be great. Um, examples could be, you know, label printing, inventory, uh, like, I suppose these are the things that you're still trying to do, but you you have problems. Um, yeah, here we go, chasing down the data. So I wonder about that uh, chasing down the data. What that means is that like looking up external resources, et cetera, maybe it's not the working backwards. Label making, yeah. Inventory. Mystery disappearances. Lots yeah, of rabbits what? eating the uh, plants by the sounds of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is that records disappearing or, or plants disappearing or both? Can maybe somebody elaborate on that one? That's a bit of an interesting one. Oh, both, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jess. Yeah, yeah. Plants disappear and records disappear. Yeah. Uh, splitting invoices, yeah. Photographic records. There are certain things here that there's an obvious kind of uh, prediction to make that technology will help you. Uh, and and will help you in the future. So so um, um, the yeah. plant data for accessions is an interesting one. And a, a good example I can think of is when you as a garden receive a wild derived accession, for example, but it doesn't necessarily come with all of the collection metadata. You know, you don't know where it was collected in the wild or you know, locality or coordinate data of its collection site. Uh, and without that information, for example, that wild provenance has, you know, relatively little meaning. Um, so I can see, you know, a very good example of the necessity to keep up when, when a new batch of plants comes in, you've got all of the relevant data to take to, to inventory it in your own database. Yeah, looking at the comments here as well, the chasing up for information. Uh, we, we're going to get into that a bit, but uh, and we know quite a few gardens have these uh, hort, hort stuff uh, or, or horticultural curators are sort of separated out from the uh, record keeping workflows, but they, they have crucial information that should be sort of, that builds up the data set, you might say. So uh, yeah, we'll talk about that a bit later. I think somebody is on mute. Maybe they had something to say or. Okay. I think we'll move to the next uh, slide. Thank you so much again. This is really helpful. Um, I think this chasing of data is, is, is an interesting one, um, which we've, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, we thought we just also well, what 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 Martin mentioned about technology and and uh, how that can sort of help you uh, walk through a few things that we we have available today that are available as separate products or technologies or in the future could be or should be integrated as part of a record keeping workflow system. So uh, one thing to start with here is this idea about uh, having unstructured data. So you people sometimes record a lot of information, but not necessarily know why or so. So that's something we, we did, we're looking at a lot so to help it to be easy to capture data, uh, not giving you uh, like an airline cockpit of, 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 of places to fill in uh, and so forth. Um, one, one feature that's already available to everybody, and uh, I'm not sure we're going to try to demo that today, but we could I'm going to try it maybe in the Netherlands. We have a workshop in Amsterdam, face-to-face uh, -face workshop next Wednesday. So if anybody, uh, uh, we can sign up until the end of uh, Friday. So please do that. Uh, so each keyboard has a speech-to-text feature. I, I'll encourage everybody to try that because it can be surprisingly 
uh, efficient, especially if you're a native speaker. So my accent is not necessarily full score on the, on the translation, but it's worth trying out. Uh, obviously, some gardens uh, like Hortus in Amsterdam and others use barcodes on, and that could be extremely efficient for certain operations. Uh, GPS, of course, uh, can be and sometimes isn't very useful depending on conditions and equipment. Um, so we worked uh, a bit already on, on image recognition and, and identify plants, etc. But there's a lot that can be done there in the future. Um, we see how drone surveys can help. Uh, on bigger bigger woodlands and gardens, uh, but they can also be used to just get, uh, when you do mapping, for example, if you have a very accurate drone map, you can map by visual approximation much more efficient than sitting there to wait for good signals from GPS, for example. And then uh, 3D mapping, uh, spatial data in general, um, and then machine learning can help us in the future for sure. Uh, the last two things we want to mention here is uh, crowdsourcing. So with, with, with the new, new platforms where, where you have the opportunity to share data across uh, you know, a global audience, there's a lot that we could do uh, in terms of uh, allowing people to participate in data capture, not necessarily anybody who's just working in the garden, but outside the garden. And then citizen science is the same thing. Think if you can let visitors take pictures of all your plants instead of you having to do it. And then you can, uh, there are so many scenarios here that really can help to burn, take off the burden of, of, of some of the work that is happening in the garden. Uh, the last thing we, we mentioned, we're going to talk about specifically later on is what a word called longitudinality, which is basically tracking information over time or tracking. It comes from a healthcare. Uh, it means that you have, for example, uh, uh, sort of health, health data or health information about a patient over time. And arguably plants are patients in many cases, <laughs> need to be looked after. So that knowledge is very important in terms of helping you to decide on what to do and, and how you can improve as an institution. Uh, I'm, I'm babbling a lot, that, Wahid, maybe you have something to add to this point. Yeah, no, I was gonna talk just briefly about the, the forgetting curve on the right, which Perhaps some of you have already familiar with that concept, but in the context of plant records, you know, it's it's making sure that the information is kept up to date and there is as minimal delay between the, the event or the time at, at which a change occurred and the point at which it entered your database. And if the, there is a delay in those two, you know, events, whether that's because of workflows or um, a lot of gardens might have paper-based workflows or, you know, sheets of paper going between different departments, for example. Um, you know, there, there can be a delay and the result of that delay is a loss of information. And like we, hit, like we see from, from Shuri, thank you. Yeah, this is a huge problem for our garden. And I don't know if you wanted to, you know, elaborate, Shuri, on that. No worries if not, but yeah, it, it's a sort of, it's a huge problem for a lot of gardens and, and this is where technology can play a big part in reducing that time between the event and the time it enters the database. Yeah, and that's why when we, when we talk about uh, setup where you say there's a record keeper and everybody else has to watch uh, instead of allowing people to participate in some degree, that, that can help a lot. Um, Hunt, hunt the new plants, yeah, that's a good example. Plants just come into the collection and nobody knows where, and uh, they're not captured by, by, they're not in the system, uh, yeah, mystery plants, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, that's, that's great. Uh, so um, we're gonna switch over a bit now to talk uh, a bit about Hortis and, and, um, and some of the, what we're going to focus a bit more on is also how, how we, uh, at this point, contribute somewhat to trying to solve some of these challenges. Um, and uh, so, so for those of you who have not heard about Hortis, I'm just going to, we're not, we're going to keep it quite brief, but, but um, uh, so Hortis is designed uh, uh, to work on any device. Uh, so it's a cloud-based platform, so you don't need installation 
it's designed for mobile and and laptop and and desktop and and the key here is uh, is that it's very easy to get started and and easy to manage so to that question about the forgetting curve uh because you can just pull up your mobile and 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 do do your work there or whatever kind of device you have at hand um and uh because cloud-based, we also are really going to work hard on this idea about uh, uh, crowdsourcing and, and where data can be shared so that people don't sit there and duplicate information that's already factually available. Um, and being a cloud service, it's sort of always available, which is great. And then uh, the last part is that we have our designer to really make sure that this product is easy to get started on. So um, what we want really by this is to allow gardens to integrate plant record workflows as a natural flow, as we talked about earlier, so that your records can be more up to date and more accurate because you are consuming and, and capturing at regular intervals where you are, where it happens. And then when you get reliable data, you can actually start using it differently. So, so the whole cost of recording this information will then uh, get more sort of return of investment, if you like. So, so that's, uh, that's part of our strategy here. And hopefully that comes through to some degree uh, through the demo. Wahid's going to have a demo shortly as well. We're just going to go through some key points that relates to what we talked about uh, in uh, earlier on today. And that is one, one thing is just longitudinality, which is basically in Hortis, we uh, we record every change as a revision. So there is basically a, 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 a full inventory of everything that's happened to the data from the beginning, which is quite unique. And it's possible because of the, the, the amount of resources you have on the cloud. So you, you, you know every change that's happened to each record from start. Uh, that gives you a lot of freedom because you, you, if you make a change, you can then see what's happened over time. And, and over time, we will also allow you to uh, do uh, an, basically a, an undo on changes, which is, is quite, makes you feel less anxious when you make changes. And, and uh, we also have on our roadmap to include draft approval. So you can allow much more participation in data capture. So because you're not afraid of uh, him or her, this, that, and the other making changes that will basically uh, Corrupt your data. That 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 that's the whole idea here. And the last part of this narrative is, of course, having this th theoretical time machine. Uh, you can also uh, open up a huge opportunity for analytics. Uh, so again, more more use for your data. For this next slide, well, he maybe you could sort of go through the draft approval a bit here. This is like a sketch on how that might work. Yeah, so this is something that um, we're working on, um, but with the technical infrastructure is in place through the um, longitudinality that have I just mentioned. And, and because of that, every change is stored. And it means that when a change is made, um, it can be sent for approval. So this is just a, a, a mock-up of how that could work. So you see on the left, the Strelitzia Juncia. Uh, I've gone in and changed the scientific name, and I've also changed the accession date. And you can see that on the second uh, screen, those two fields have gone red. And the point of this is that it means that it can be saved as a draft, and it can be sent off to somebody else in the team who might have different privileges. Uh, in this case, they can approve those changes, at which point it will enter the database. Now, the advantage not only is, is, is this more of a collaborative way of record keeping, but also it's a way of storing information that you might not be so sure of, um, and it's still entering your database. So it's still, you know, you're still up to date with your information. Um, and then you can choose when to, you know, fully get that record approved and, you know, entering into the system. So there's a lot of flexibility and we think this is going to open up ways, um, not only for more people to get involved, for example, you know, volunteers, part-time staff, et cetera, but also the ability for you to get more stuff recorded and documented when it matters most. 
Thank you, Wahid. So, um, one aspect around this as well is, which is already available in in uh, in Hortis, is uh, to help you to uh, focus your time where it matters. So, uh, with Hortis, you could sort of allow uh, you to control how often you need to check up on a plant. Certain plants, like a, a well-established oak tree or quercus, you might not need to check that up more than every five years or maybe even longer. And and uh, whereas if you have a, a, some specimens that are suffering uh, with illness or something, you might want to check them up weekly. So by doing that, you can have a much more focused effort on where you where you basically do your inventory of where, where you go and look for, for plants uh, and how they are. So that, this is one technique that we already have in place to help you to be more efficient. Um, there's a question here about uh, dead uh, adding other conditions. Well, dead is more of a, not necessarily a condition in Hortis, it's more of a, a, a sort of a, a permanent state. So plants are, are classified as being present or absent in the collection, absent meaning dead or discarded or whatever. So, so that's like uh, this, the, the conditions here, poor, fair, good, excellent, are related to a plant that is present to the, in the collection. Um, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, I think we are ready to go through. Uh, let's see, sorry. Yeah, and I can uh, very briefly show you in the demonstration um, shortly. And before we get on to that, um, just a, a quick plug to encourage people to subscribe to um, our progress and you can get a monthly update a newsletter about some of the progress we've made in Hortis. Uh, so you, you'll see that map filters was released yesterday and the access roles can now be changed as of three days ago. Um, and when you subscribe, you get event updates as well. So things like webinars and also in-person meetups like the event next week. Um, and all you need to do is just head to Hortis.com um, and there's a little um, subscribe button and you can put in your email address uh, if you want to get involved. Uh, but I was just going to briefly talk about the hazard um, concept that Alsha mentioned. Um, and in Hortis, I, I suppose we can go straight into the demo now, unless you have anything to add, Havard. No, oh, great idea. I'll stop sharing and you can take over the sharing. So for those who aren't familiar, um, as Havard mentioned, Hortis works on all platforms and devices, as long as you have a, a capable browser. So any modern browser would do the trick. Uh, and each garden has their own URL. Uh, in this case, we're going to take a look at De Hortus, which is a garden in Amsterdam. And login options are very easy. You have your own email address and password or Google and Microsoft as authentication options. So one fewer password to remember, hopefully, for many of you. And if you have a multi-sited garden, um, you can see your different sites here. So in this case, we'll just go to this particular one. And I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to keep this brief, but you can see an overview of your collection on the home page, the number of accessions, plant materials and tax, et cetera, as well as a snapshot of the provenance of those accessions. Uh, and on the left, quick access shortcuts go to various parts. Now, when we were talking about improving efficiencies and workflows, one of the things that we thought about very early on is you want to get to your list where everything is happening. So with one simple click of the button, you're in your table already. And this is where, you know, a lot of actions can be performed. So let's, we can very quickly do some searches. And you see here, I've intentionally misspelled it, but our search algorithm actually takes into account uh, misspellings as well as doing uh, exact matches as well. So already, you know, if you have misspellings or you're not very familiar with scientific names, already this is helping you to improve um, the efficiency with which you search your collections. And similarly, 
you know, shorthand searches are also just as effective. Now, you know, we're not encouraging you to become lazy taxonomists, but it's a good way of, of getting to that data very quickly. And similarly, you know, filtering is something that we spent a lot of time on. You know, how can we make it um, very easy to access and also very quick to start creating quite complex searches? So you see by default, we exclude absent materials. Um, so again, a quick toggle will, you know, bring all of those dead materials back up. But when it comes to filtering, you know, you can very quickly create filters based on locations um, or any other um, plant material field that we might have. So, for example, you know, I can just put in any one, for example. Um, and you can combine this with multiple filters as well as combining it with search as well. So you can start to see how, you know, directly from the list, you can interrogate your collection um, very quickly and easily. Um, similarly, if we just go into on record as an example, we were talking about um, the concept of longitudinality and this audit log. So the ability for people to collaborate as an institution, you want to see you know, how your records are evolving over time. And here you see in the activity log, we have all of the changes that were made to that particular record. And this can be extremely helpful if you have lots of people, uh, you know, going back to talking about democratizing plant records, you can feel safe about making changes because everything is, is stored um, here. And similarly, when it comes to collaborative tools, you know, being able to share this with other people in your institution is also, you know, something we've thought long and hard about. And this is only possible through um, cloud-based technologies. So being a web product, you know, if I share this, the URL is copied and I could say, hey, Havard, take a look at this Tillandsia, you know, it, it needs some a TLC and he can go in and, and get to it straight off. The other thing I was going to mention here is the observation that Havard talked about just briefly. And here we have a few um, sort of key bits of information that will relate to this concept of an observation cycle and stale data. So the last observation for this plant was on the 4th of, of November, and I can today submit a new observation. And I can say, you know, I can change the condition, I can put in some notes, and I can set a follow-up cycle. And the point about this is that when it passes the uh, due by date, if you like, then it, you'll get a, a little warning symbol here telling you to go in and check out the Tillandsia because you're overdue the follow-up. So it's these types of uh, approaches that we want to try and get better at and to help you to help prioritize the way you manage your plants. Um, the other thing that I will uh, mention is the map. Um, and this is also a key, um, you know, element or dimension of your data set. And this is also something that we feel you should be able to interrogate with speed and efficiency. So if we go back to our searches that we did earlier, the search is also linked to the map. So I can very quickly see all of my Quercus I can, you know, do um, very quick, um, you know, get to what I want to see very quickly. And something that was released a couple of days ago um, is the ability to filter. So I think somebody mentioned hazards and, you know, I could go in and put in a tag on, um, you know, this Tillandsia that it's, you know, if I go into the record, for example, uh, and you can see these tags labeled propagation successful. I could go in and add a tag for hazard, for example. Um, and then when I save that change, you can see that it's been added there. And now if I go back to the map, I can then filter out some of those records that I might have selected as a hazard. 
So in order to do that, again, the filtering works very similarly to the search. I can you know, filter by location, for example, you know, show me all of the plants in this particular bed. I zoom in and they're all here, for example. Um, and if we go back to the hazard uh, example, I could filter for all of the hazards. And there's my hazard. There's the Tillandsia that we tagged earlier. So these types of approaches we've been spending a lot of time on, and we feel the map is a very key component of being able to look at your data, interrogate it, and create workflows from that. How about, did you want to add in anything? No, no, thank you. One thing that might be nice for people to see as well, if you ch change the format to to the a mobile or a tablet, just to sort of highlight. The, so this is the, one of the challenges when you design software uh, that, uh, that you um, can actually do all the stuff you want to do on a smartphone that has quite a small real estate. So our designers worked hard to, uh, yeah, if you now do the same Kirkus search, for example, Wahid, just to give you people a sense of, that you can actually stand out in the garden and do this quite efficiently. Um, and of course, when, you, when, you, when you're mapping plants, you might actually want to be out in the garden sometimes. So, so uh, uh, as you can see here, if you now switch to satellite uh, map as well, and you sort of, sometimes that can be helpful to, to sort of see the reference points that you have around you. Uh, yeah. No, I think uh, looking at our time, maybe we should, um, but that's, that's great. Unless anybody has some questions. Uh, there was one comment about, uh, yeah, location search. Yeah, we showed you how that works, filter and search. And, uh, and then the other part is, uh, does filter serve same to advanced search? Well, it's a similar concept, trying to find uh, find what you have in your collection. So yeah, that, that might be one thing that we, we see, obviously, that we'll evolve with is the ability to save searches they've done before and stuff like that. But now we the feedback has been very great from all the people who use the product in terms of um, being able to. And, and uh, last, we mentioned 3D maps. So, with Hortis, we, we use what is called vector-based map technologies, which allows us to evolve into 3D mapping later on. Uh, so we can put epiphytes growing inside another tree, for example, on a higher, you know, at a higher level, two meters off the ground, for example, or something. So, so there's a lot of fun stuff to come, uh, but the, 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 we established, we believe, a good uh, sort of platform to do that. Uh, Great, okay. I'm gonna go back to our slides quickly here. So, uh, to summarize on Hortis, uh, we, we, we have a good, uh, we get new gardens joining every week now. And, uh, and uh, so if you are interested, obviously get in touch. Uh, some gardens who have quite advanced features maybe uh, are, uh, most of the gardens who join us at this time is, is typically gardens with who are on spreadsheet or on basic systems, but um, get in touch and we can discuss that with you. Um, so, uh, Wahid, maybe you can talk a bit about this wonderful uh, fly trap. Do you, there's a video of this person, isn't it? Or this Yeah, player. yeah this is a, a video of uh, a Venus fly trap, and um, this YouTuber has uh, put some cotton beards and hats and very funky things on there but but that's not the point of the uh, the 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 slide we want to know um you know in the context of efficiency and workflow improvements you know what's on your wish list you know what's what does your future plant record system look like if it's there to try and help you improve your workflows so i think we're going to have a a short discussion or any comments that people have that are, are kind of immediate immediate ideas on what they'd like to see. Open mic day. <laughs> it's hard to maybe to think about this uh, sort of on the fly here. 
think Monique, maybe you, if you are on mute or there's two Moniques. Mute. Oh. Hi. There you go. Ah, oh, that's me. Um, uh, I think actually I've just put a question on chat, which is, um, so I've had some uh, donated material, which has got metadata on it um, from uh, original collection data. And I know you have, have that already, but in terms of, um, of general notes and from uh, stuff coming from Q, there's got the most extraordinary uh, level of detail in terms of propagation, this sort of thing. I don't know where to put it. I, you know, this is all information that I desperately want to hang on to, but I'm, I'm, I'm unsure as to, to where to put it. Um, for example, yeah, propagation, uh, my own propagation notes, will there be a, um, a facility to or an area that you're going to develop that was my question sorry a bit rambly no no that's very good i i think what uh one thing that we uh we have as a strategy is to evolve on the capabilities of recording notes in hortis so so that meaning notes with the formatting capabilities notes that can be tagged so that you can basically uh, manage unstructured data very efficiently, especially this type of data, which is quite hard to formalize. Uh, so, so, uh, so that's definitely uh, where we will help, especially those scenarios that you described there are about unusual. So you can't really come with a formulaic approach to how you capture and, and, and organize that data. So, so I think that will capture or, or support many of those things you described there. Uh, so that that's definitely on our sort of on our wish list as well. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but thank you. That's very very helpful input. Pleasure. So there's another one here. Uh, keeping balance between freedom in tagging and standardizing it. Uh, yeah. So one thing that's really great. So I, we we do do anticipate anticipate that some gardens will go uh, you know be a bit too eager with tagging and you get a lot of tags that you think oh this needs to be cleaned up and and we see that with other types of data as well we know for example some gardens have a tendency to maybe create tremendous amount of bed structure to, to because they don't have good mapping and and uh, uh, to that degree because it's uh, because we have longitudinality you could get rid of tags and the, but the data still be there historically, so it's a slightly different approach. So 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 I think uh, I think what we will offer is in ways of you to curate that data or that those tags in a much freer way, so that that it becomes less of a problem that it you got hundred tags for example. But we we probably might also uh, if we see that's why we have these discussions like here. We we learn and then we might group the tags. One thing we know that we are very likely to do is to basically introduce tag grouping so that you can have tags with the like under different sort of subheadings to help you to um so yeah uh i think i have a somebody left his mobile phone here on the ladder uh so i'm going to deal with that well why he carry on <laughs> yeah i think um yeah, Martin, you had a, a good a good idea about um, most frequently used tags or most recently used tags is a good way of, you know, if you're repeatedly using the same tags, you know, how can we help you to select those with the, the greatest ease? So that's a very good idea of how that might work. I've actually just thought of something else as well, which is... Um... Uh, if something is um, on a red list or, um, for example, if it's got plant passport information that needs to be recorded, is that something that will kind of, if you like, say I've, I've got a glyptostrobus that I've just added to the collection, will there be an automatic system that immediately says, oh yeah, this is on the critically endangered list, red star or something, or is that up to me to input? That, that's a great question. And, and uh, so our, our strategy here, our plan is to introduce uh, shared taxonomy and that will happen in 
2023 at some point, where we also then want to uh, any factual information, like like you say, red listing is factual. It's not not a, like a debatable whether mm. you know. Uh, so so that definitely then will be part of that shared data set. So and then getting some synchronization ability with with the IUCN so that that data is also reliable and up to date. So you don't have to maintain that. Yes, definitely. That's that's part of the joy of of a cloud platform as well, where you can where basically are in the same kind of uh, uh, you know database uh, structures so that that's definitely something we want to do cool thank you and 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 just to add to that we see that there's a i just did some search on on the, the, the regional red listing is is very uh, also quite time consuming to keep, keep up with and i think those lists are also available so 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 that that's uh, you know certain species have like they're mentioned on 50 different regional lists, uh, for example. So, so that that's also sometimes more relevant, you could argue as well. So, hmm. I think uh, Alsha had a question on updating aerial views or adding drone photography. We're in a large construction period with many many larger trees removed. The view is outdated, and trees have been removed and are obstructing the new plant mapping. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so at, at this point, the, our platform is ready to do that. That's the short answer. So that's definitely something we will offer uh, at some point next year. Hard to say exactly when, but we will. Uh, we are actually, to some degree, with with the data set we demonstrated here, we are doing. We're we loading a map from a specific web server already, or map server. So so um, the technology is already there. We just need to to get it get it sort of uh, available for gardens to configure themselves basically. But but yes, I think that's the future for many gardens as well, to get uh, drone footage with, at the right time and do that more often because it's quite cost effective. It's quite quite difficult to, to get a good uh, sort of vector-based map. Uh, it requires a certain skill that might not be easy to get hold of, et cetera. So, so for many, a, a good drone map is very, uh, very valuable and and of course very annoying or nice to do that when you know when when it's happening instead of relying on google's satellites to come over when you're having a wedding or something going on in your garden so, or construction work as you mentioned yeah i think ray mentioned report generation did we already cover that uh yeah we haven't talked so much about this today. One thing we want to explore when we evolve Hortis as well is to uh, think digital first as much as we can, because I think a lot of report, so there's a theory that we have yet, yet to confirm that many plant record systems are, are very siloed. They, they are only accessible for a few staff members. So there's a desire to go and print reports to then or or PDFs or, and then share that. Whereas if everybody with with our license model as well, if users who don't make data changes are free users, so you can have you can then basically create a digital uh, data extract that you share with your director or whatever. So there's much more opportunities when everybody can access the data on their phone or whatever they have at hand, and and that's where we really want to move. Uh, so that the idea of running a report as in printing it is, is like a very rare exception. And sharing also outside our institution is natural uh, as a follow-up here um, that we'll also uh, focus on so that you can, yeah, if you want to collaborate with other uh, peers outside your institution, you should be allowed to do that as well. Oh, sorry, another question. So it's always me. Um, we um, so I've just had a biosecurity meeting all day, and uh, one of the things that came up was uh, creating a list of all the genus that we bring in, say uh, which has been purchased or donated over the year, and then going to a specific website so we can look at each genus and see what the um, biosecurity risks are. Uh, linked to that particular genus, say, I don't know, Forsythia or whatever. Um, is there a way of creating a report so that I can share that with the particular um, 
biosecurity, uh, well, DEFRA, if you like. Um, is that something that, that's possible? In a bit of a roundabout way, maybe, Wahid, maybe we could take that offline with you and then help you with that. Okay, uh, cool. Since yeah. so we're also conscious of time here, we're, we're running close Sorry, to yes. Uh, no, 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 it's great questions. We love it. So, so uh, we've got some wish lists already. So we're making notes as we talk here. So that's great. Um, Thank you. I think maybe we should uh, be, some people might need to go to other meetings, et cetera. So, so maybe it's a good time to round off uh, with our, uh, so these are three top tips that we have sort of uh, accumulated going through this preparation, preparation for this session. Uh, understand how your plant records support your mission. Uh, that's a good uh, start to get your uh, sort of efficiency uh, at a high level. Uh, get a broader participation from all levels of your organization that helps you with the, the risk of um, reducing accuracy, uh, you know, with, the, with the, not only that you have the forgetting curve. See, people mentioned that earlier today as well with the, uh, the chasing down data. So if people can participate, they are more responsible to also contribute to this particular effort of, of keeping your plant records up to date. And then the last part, um, which, uh, you know, evaluate the tools you use at regular intervals, not only plant record systems, but other, other we mentioned the uh, GPS and there, there are other ways to do things uh, and not, new ideas come along all the time. So, so uh, it's very tempting to be, keep on going and doing what you've been doing for years. Uh, so we, that's our top three tips. And we learned some other tips from you guys today as well, which was really, really helpful. So that's really, thank you all for sharing that. I don't know if we have anything to add, Wahid, before we close for today. No, I think that's been brilliant to hear some of your ideas and it will give us lots of food for thought as we move into 2023 um, and exciting things to come, that's for sure. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today and uh, yeah, we'll see you. Wish you all a festive season. I suppose that's a good way of putting it and uh, look forward to Stay keeping in touch uh, for next year, etc. And uh, yeah, again, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to see you all.